HMP. I want to thank the First Churches, by the way, for providing us this space for a chance for us all to hear from one of the, if not the leading voice in progressive talk radio. He is a rock star in this market. Of course, I'm talking about Tom Hartman. Before we get going, um, I want to thank some people who have made this broadcast possible. One of the reasons why Tom Hartman is so popular and why he is so good at what he does is because Tom Hartman believes, as we do at WHMP in the River, in a thing called sustainability. And you may not know this, but there is a college in Brattleboro, Vermont, called Marlboro College, that has a graduate MBA program in sustainability. I believe it may be the only one of its kind. And I want to ask Ralph Mima from the Marlboro College to come up and say a few words about that program to get the, the program started. Ralph Mima. Great pleasure to uh, talk, talk about our program before turning the uh, stage over here to the new show, or to, to the uh, real show. Um, my name is Ralph Mayan. I'm the director of the MBA program at uh, Marlboro College Graduate School up in Brattleboro, about 45 minutes from here. And we launched about uh, two and a half years ago. It's a, it's a full, fully scaled MBA program covering uh, management of people and money and processes and technology and all the things an MBA program would normally involved, but an underpinning of the program is a focus on sustainability. And we're concerned with ecological health, environmental protection, social issues, communities, and all the things that, that are part of this now very widely or, or broadly defined concept of sustainability. The reason we're here, and we, we are uh, very happy that we had the opportunity to sponsor tonight's event, is that uh, I'm quite sure that there's a very large overlap between Tom Hartman's audience and the sort of people who are attracted to our program. Um, our students are, uh, in interestingly enough, generally people who, who never considered an MBA, and were not looking for an MBA either, but found us. Um, they are based from Washington, D.C., that area, all the way up to the Canadian border and from Boston all the way to Rochester, New York at the moment, so pretty much the whole Northeast. And um, come to Brattleboro for about three days a month to work face-to-face, -face, and then go back to where they live and work, and work online in, in virtual mode until we meet again. Um, th this may be swearing in church, but you know, who needs an MBA? I, I'm the director of an MBA program, but I'd be the first to admit that there are many extraordinarily successful business and social entrepreneurs in the world who don't have an MBA. And we don't have to think too hard to come up with names like Oprah Winfrey, Rin, Winfrey and Richard Branson and Bill Gates, and, and the list is long, of successful entrepreneurs who don't have MBAs. Um, why do an MBA? Well, the skills aspect is very important. But frankly, and I'm speaking of myself as well as many other people, not, not, not every one of us is, a, is an Oprah Winfrey or a Bill Gates, but we have aspirations to make some sort of difference in our, in our lives, in our communities, to, to successfully run a business, to successfully start a nonprofit, to successfully drive some sort of social change where we live. And that takes a lot of skills, and so an MBA program like ours offers those skills, but it also offers an opportunity to get together with like-minded people and to inspire and energize each other to find partners for ventures that uh, we want to develop together. And there are not many programs like ours in the United States yet. The two pioneers that launched about uh, five years ahead of ours on the West Coast, I'll name them, are the Presidio School of Management in San Francisco and Bay Bridge Graduate Institute outside of Seattle. Um, they are probably the two pioneering sustainability-driven MBA programs in the United States. Neither one of them emerged from a business school, which is, I think is quite telling. They were startups from scratch, emerged as, a, as an MBA program, a standalone MBA program. And it was their lead that we followed. There are a few other schools that I would classify as part of this kind of MBA program with a sustainability focus, um, although not many. And uh, even in this part of the country with so many colleges and universities, uh, I would assert that we're, we're one of the very few, if not the only one, to follow this kind of model in uh, New England. Um, 
So I don't really have too much more to say, but thank you all very much for coming to tonight's event. And uh, we'll be in the back of the room there, I guess the front, um, at the end, if any of you would like to know more about our program. So anyway, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed the evening. I just say we're very happy to have Marlboro College as part of the WHMP River family, as well as other participating sponsors in tonight's event, Jonathan Sports World, One Way Screen Printing, and Woodworks. They all helped sponsor this. And thanks to Sylvester's Restaurant for the great VIP reception. For those of you who were there, you know, they went over and above. They're a great organization, and we love those people, and uh, we're happy to have them, again, as part of the family. Yep. Thank you. You know, whenever I go to a professional conference, I'm always asked by fellow program directors in the news talk field, where, where is the next generation of talk talent going to come from? <laughs> and I have the same response. I, I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, there's potentially great talk show hosts everywhere. We've made a couple of our own sort of homegrown talk show hosts in our time at WHMP. One guy, though, who, and I'm going to embarrass him a little bit because Dave Packman, when he first got into business, uh, he was syndicated on a couple of stations on Pacifica. And when he first started, I thought, this guy's got some ability, um, but I wasn't sure. Uh, Dave Packman, this was about a year and a half ago, and in that time, Dave Packman has grown into one of the best talk show, young talk show hosts I think I've ever heard. He is the youngest guy ever to be syndicated, I believe, on a talk radio. He's shrugging, he's not sure. We'll have to check with the Guinness Book of World Records on that. But uh, he is a guy who's on over 100 stations, a number of television stations, and it's not going to surprise me if he is one day up here in front of you as the host of his own nationally syndicated talk show. He is going to introduce our special guest, David Packman from Midweek Politics Radio. Thank you. I won't talk very long. I know nobody's really here to see me. I know everybody probably has two questions. Why am I up here and why can I barely see you over this podium? Uh, I've been listening to Tom for a long time, and I was lucky enough to meet him really by chance at a talk radio conference last summer. We got to talking and started doing some work together. And it's great for me to have to listen to Tom's show, at least somewhat, to keep an eye on what's going on. Because I really find myself not only agreeing with him, but just really thinking of, he makes me think of new ways to process a lot of what's on the news and what's going on. And I mean, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the healthcare bill that we've got going on. How many people have heard of this BP oil spill that we're talking about now? <laughs> Most people. You know, I have some a prop over here just to show you. Remember when Republican senators were putting the bill on the table and saying, look at all those pages? It's actually scary that it's that big. Do you, anybody remember that? Well, when I looked at that, I thought, people's lives are at stake here. To me, it's not so scary that this is a health care bill. It's that these are the regulations for BP. I found that to be a lot scary. And by the way, even, even more scary than that, do you remember that question from Katie Couric to Sarah Palin about which newspapers she reads? This is that list. I found it. And this is the scariest one of all. So let me bring on Tom. I won't say any more. Tom Hartman, come on up. Thank you. It's great to be here. And thank you. Special, special thanks to, to uh, the folks at WHMP, at Marlboro College, Jonathan Sports World, and the Screen Printing Woodworks, the folks over at Sylvester's, to, uh, to Sean O'Malley, um, to Chris, forgive me if I'm ruining names here, Chris Collins, Howard, I don't know your last name, wherever you are. Howard Cross. Howard Cross? Cross? Cross. Okay. Uh, Sam Winning and Scott Howard and Mark Latanzi? Latanzi? Yeah? Okay, cool. And David Packman, who is my collaborator, colleague, and uh, works, we work together on a whole bunch of things. And he does some great stuff for us. Thanks to Odyssey Bookstore, too, for bringing books. Um, I will be signing them at, when we're done in the back of the room. And uh, there's one that I borrowed from them, and then I marked it up really badly. And it's going to be the basis of my talk tonight. And if anybody wants to buy it, um, then I don't have to. 
because I've already got a copy. I just forgot to bring it with me. Um, you know, in some ways it seems like uh, President Obama coming into office and, and I mean, just consider the, the, everything that's happened, you know, from the economy to now the oil spill and whatnot, and, and, and yet at the same time he's, he's such an optimist. I mean, it, 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 it reminds me of uh, this, the, the old story about the guy who was a professional uh, gambler, a professional poker player, and he decided that he would take a vacation and get away from work. So he took a cruise, and he was on this cruise ship, and he just couldn't quit playing poker, you know, because he loved doing it. So he's down in the boiler room with a bunch of guys playing, and, and the, the cards are being dealt out to him, and, and, he, and oh, there's an ace of spades, oh, there's a king of spades, oh, there's a queen of spades, there's a jack. And he gets a, a royal flush for the first time in his life, dealt right to him on the first, first deal. And he's looking at this going, wow, this is incredible. I must be... On, this must just be the luckiest ship in the world. I mean, I, this must be my lucky trip here on the SS Titanic. <laughs> so, sometimes you wonder, you know, is that, is that how it is? So, but we, the BP situation, I think, is, is emblematic of, of two major problems that we have in the United States. And increasingly, they're going, going global, although there are some nations that have succeeded in pushing back against this. And the first is the idea that, that uh, traditional competitive capitalism is old and, and uh, unnecessary and has been replaced by monopoly capitalism. And most people are even unaware of the fact that we have monopoly capitalism in the United States, that, that a, a, literally a small handful of companies control our media. 13,000 newspapers are published by 11 corporations, uh, not newspapers, magazines in the United States that, that uh, there's a handful of companies that control our retail sector, there's a handful of companies that control our agricultural sector, there's a handful of companies that control much of our manufacturing, our finance sector, you know, five companies control an amount of money equal to 50% of our GDP, seven companies, 65% of our GDP. I mean, it's really pretty mind-boggling. And what monopoly does is it drives out competition. It prevents the idea of people getting good service. For example, in France, if you have cable TV, if you have a cable coming into your house, the government says that cable, because it's a natural monopoly, if you have, you have one wire coming into your house, right? And so you can't have like 30 companies all say, well, you know, I'll run a wire, you get 30 wires coming into your house. It's the same thing with power and water and things like that. Because they consider it a natural monopoly, but the content over it in this modern digital age can come from anybody. So the French government, says the wire itself is a basic utility. So it's like the old, if you've ever played Monopoly, it's like the electric company. You know, you get a nice predictable profit on it, but uh, you're not going to get rich. However, any company can compete over that wire to provide telephone service, high definition tele television service, and uh, you know, basic internet, all the basic internet stuff. And the average price now in France for 144 high def channels free unlimited long distance calling to 77 countries and 20 meg upload and download reliable speed. The average price, the average consumer in France pays $33 a month because there are a whole bunch of little companies that are competing with each other. And whereas here in the United States you get a wire coming into your house and it's from Comcast and it's like whose box are you going to get? Well gee I think it's going to be Comcast or you know whoever it may be. So there was a time in the United States when monopoly capitalism was being practiced as it is now. And that was in the 1770s. It really started in the, in the, in the 1600s. There's a whole long history there. But, but basically in, in the 1770s, in order to buy clothing, for example, in the United States, it was against the law to make fine clothing in this country. You had to import it from England. You could, you could shear wool, you could grow cotton, you had to send it to England where it was made into clothing and then you bought it from England. But they did the same thing with all of their colonies. It's why uh, Mahatma Gandhi's logo was a spinning wheel. It's why he, all the interviews he did, he would sit at his spinning wheel while he was doing it. He was defying the law. He was breaking the law. When he led people on the salt march down to the ocean where they made big, uh, big square areas that they cordoned off with wood to catch the salt water and let it evaporate in the sun, that was against the law. That, that he was actually processing it and selling it locally. The salt was supposed to go to England, be crushed, be ground, be properly packaged, and then s sent back and sold. They wanted the jobs in England, they wanted the raw materials coming out of the colonies. 
I mean, it was so bad in the United States that when George Washington was elected, and it's a fascinating story, it's actually in my next book uh, that opens with this story. When George Washington, he was standing out in his field in 17, I think it was 87, as I recall. And uh, um, I'm forgetting the guy's name now, but uh, a friend of his rode up on his horse. And here's George Washington in Virginia out, at, out at, on his plantation. This guy rides up on his horse and says, uh, the Continental Congress has just met, the Constitution's been ratified, we have a new country, and you've been elected president. And, and Washington had about 20 days to get ready for the inauguration. First thing he did was he visited his mother, who was in her 70s, and said goodbye. And she said, she was slipping away, and she said, you'll never see me again alive, and, but I'm so glad to see this happen. And he never did see her again alive. He went off to New York City to be, New York was then the capital of the United States. He went off to New York City to be sworn into office. But then he needed a suit. And the only good clothing that you could find in Virginia was made in the, in, in the United Kingdom. It was made in England because that had been the law right up until a year or so before. But there was this one rebel guy in Connecticut who had, starting with the Revolutionary War, just decided he wasn't going to follow the rules of England any longer, and he started making fine clothing. One guy, one store. And so uh, George Washington sent a friend of his, John Knox, on a horse to Connecticut to get a suit for him to be inaugurated in that was made in America. And the guy didn't have a fancy black suit, you know, with a top hat and all that stuff that, that uh, president should be inaugurated in. He had a nice brown, kind of what we might call a business suit today. I mean, you know, it was a, but it was, it was a modest suit. But George Washington said, get it. And that's what he wore to be inaugurated in. Now, later in the day, when he had the official portrait taken, the one that you can see at the White House, he was wearing British black. But he was actually sworn into office wearing an American suit. And, and because they had just defeated Monopoly. It began, the defeat of Monopoly in, in the United States really began in 1773. There was, the, the largest corporation in the world was the British East India Company. And it had been started in 1601 by Queen Elizabeth I. And the British East India Company, people think that the, the pilgrims, you know, Mayflower Rock, they settled America, they were the first here. Actually, the Mayflower bringing the pilgrims was its third trip. The Mayflower was a ship that was owned by the British East India Company and had been rented by the pilgrims. And that was the third time it came over. The first colony in the United States was founded on, in Jamestown in Virginia. And Jamestown, at least the first British colony in the United States, I mean, we can, there's obviously stuff going on in Hispaniola and, and stuff going on up in Newfoundland. But the, the uh, Jamestown was named after King James, who at that point in time was the king and was the largest stockholder in the East India Company. Because when it was started, the stockholders were the, king, the royal families and the members of the House of Lords. And the, the state was called Virginia, named after the Virgin Queen, and, which was Queen Elizabeth I. She was referred to as the Virgin Queen. And so, you know, the whole, it was a company-owned business, basically. Virginia was owned by the company, Jamestown was owned by the company, and increasingly this was, this was basically how America was started. And so by, you know, 150 years later, 1773 or 170 years later, by that time, there were enough people and there were enough businesses that there were a whole bunch of little tea shops all up and down the East Coast. They were the, the tea shops and the bars were the, people, were the places where people got together. You know, they didn't have TV back then, they didn't have bowling alleys, they didn't have theaters, they had some, some drama, but basically what people did is they went to the tea shops or they went to the bars. And, and the tea shops were actually far more popular than the bars. And every, about every city block had a tea shop in it, and the tea shops imported generally their own tea. In fact, it was one of the major ways they competed. There were all these little, they called them privateers, um, the private ship owners who ran little ships and they would import tea from Holland or they would Im or from the, they'd buy it from the Dutch trading companies, or in some cases they'd actually import it f directly from India or directly from Asia. And these small companies were not paying taxes on this imported tea to the, to the, uh, to the British government, but Far more galling than that was that the British East India Company wasn't making a profit on this tea. Because keep in mind, the virtually in the entire power structure of England owned stock in the British East India Company. So in 1773, the, the British Parliament passed what was referred to as the, as the Tea Act of 1773. You probably heard about it in high school. Except what you probably didn't learn in high school was the Tea Act led to a, an outcry of no taxation without representation 
but it was the reverse of what you think. What the Tea Act did is it lowered the tax on tea specifically for the British East India Company to zero and gave them a rebate on a whole bunch of tea tax that they'd paid the year before so that they could import massive quantities of tea into the United States and undersell all the entrepreneurs and drive them out of business. So all these small businesses all over, all over uh, New England said, to hell with this, you know, we're going to fight back. We're, in, we're not going to put up with this. And, and in fact, they did fight back, and then they fought back pretty vigorously. Um, George Robert Twelve Tree Hughes was a soldier, he was 16 years old, soldier in the Revolutionary War, served with George Washington, he was a good friend of Paul Revere's, and, uh, and he was, he had a very colorful history, he, he, was, he was just an average guy basically, who was in unaverage circumstances, and when the, when the when the Boston Tea Party happened, because it was a million dollar act of vandalism against the largest and most power, and literally a million dollars in today's dollars, against the largest and most powerful corporation in the world and the government that defended it, these guys all realized that they were taking their lives in their hands. And to this day, we only know the actual identity of three or four people who were at the Boston Tea Party. They swore an oath of silence for 50 years. And George, Robert Twelve Tree Hughes, because he was only like 18, 19 years old, or actually he was younger than that, he was like 13 years old, when the, when the uh, Tea Party happened in 1773, he lived long enough to write the only existing account of the Boston Tea Party, which is you know, pretty amazing when you consider it. And when I was writing this book, I, I was just so fascinated by the whole idea of the, of how this country came about and how it got started and everything else that you, you probably can't see this, but this is a picture of the front piece. And there's a picture of George Robert Twelve Tree Hughes. I, I, I went out and I found in an antiquarian bookstore an actual copy of this book that he wrote back in, in like 1813 or something where he wrote his diary of the, of the uh, Boston Tea Party. And it was just amazing to read the only eyewitness account that exists of the, of the Boston Tea Party, of the actual Boston Tea Party itself. And his story is remarkable. The, it started out right after the Tea Act was passed in 1773. And now I'm quoting from Hughes, from his book. He says, the East India, the, 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 the Tea Act was passed. He said, well, actually quoting him, he said, uh, the Tea Act rendered the smuggling of tea an object and was frequently practiced, and their resolutions against it, although observed by many with little fidelity, had greatly diminished the importation into the colonies of this commodity. Meanwhile, an immense quantity of it was accumulating in the warehouses of the East India Corporation in England. This company petitioned the king to suppress the duty to three pence per pound upon its introduction into America. The king did, and that was the Tea Act of 1773. Hughes then writes, the East India Company, however, received permission to transport tea free of all duty from Great Britain to America, allowing it to wipe out its small competitors and take over the tea business of all of North America. Hence, it was no longer the small vessels of private merchants who went to vend tea for their own account in the ports of the colonies, but on the contrary, ships of an enormous burthen that transported immense quantities of this commodity which by the aid of the public authority might, as they supposed, easily be landed and amassed in suitable magazines, this, you know, big warehouses. Accordingly, the company sent its agents in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia 600 chests of tea, this is because of the Tea Act, and a proportionate amount to Charleston and other maritime cities of the American continent. The colonies were now arrived at the decisive moment when they must cast the die and determine their fate. And then he, he goes through this fascinating description of the first meeting in Faneuil Hall and how they discovered in the middle of the meeting as they were trying to figure out what to do that there was an agent of the British East India Company among them. There was a spy in the room and they get very, very upset about this. And, but they, they finally decided to do something but they weren't quite sure exactly what. So a couple days later, a fellow by the name of Rusticus publishes a, uh, uh, I mean he was a blogger of his day, right? He puts together a one-page flyer and nails it to trees and houses all over, in the middle of the night, all over Boston. And here's what it says. 
Are we in like manner to be given to this, up to the disposal of the East India Company, who now have the assurance to step forth in aid to the minister to execute his plan of enslaving America? Their conduct in Asia for some years past has given simple proof how little they regard the laws of nations, the rights, liberties, or lives of men. They have levied war, excited rebellions, dethroned lawful princes, and sacrificed millions for the sake of gain. The revenues of mighty kingdoms have centered in their coffers, and these not being sufficient to glut their avarice, they have by the most unparalleled barbarities, extortions, and monopolies, stripped the miserable inhabitants of their property and reduced entire nations to indigence and ruin. 1,500,000 men, it is said, perished by famine in one year, not because the earth denied its fruits, but because this corporation and their servants engulfed all the necessities of life and set them at so high a price that the poor could not afford to purchase them. Which is, you know, not only was happening then, but in 1848 when the potato famine happened in Ireland and over a million people died of famine, Ireland was exporting food to England throughout that time. You know, I mean, this is, this was just, this is the outcome of monopoly, particularly court, uh, uh, government-sponsored monopoly. So, the 28th of November, 1773, the ship Dartmouth arrives in the Boston port, and Rusticus is at it again. He nails this to the, to the doors. Friends, brethren, countrymen, that worst of plagues, the detect, detested tea, has arrived in this harbor. The hour of destruction, a manly opposition to the mass, machinations of tyranny, stares you in the face. Every friend to his country, to himself, and to posterity is now called upon to meet in Faneuil Hall at 9 o'clock this day, at which time the bells will ring to make a united and successful resistance to this last, worst, and most destructive measure of administration. Now up until that point, uh, Jefferson, just six months earlier, had published a book called The Summary View of the Rights of British Americans which was about how to be a good British citizen in the United States. He wasn't talking about separation from England. Thomas Paine wasn't talking about separation from England. Very few, actually, of the, of the people we think of as the founders were, think, were talking about separation from England. So anyhow, they met in Faneuil Hall that night and decided, a, group of, a, a, a small group of them, a little over 100 people, decided that's it, we're going to do it. And that, literally that night, they dressed up as Indians and they, they went on board the ships, and it was actually, here's another surprising part of the story, I just find this fascinating. Um, he says it was, this is the actual story. You've never heard this before, it's never been published before, you know, unless you were around in 1813. It was now evening, and I immediately dressed myself in the costume of an Indian, equipped with a small hatchet, which I and my associates denominated the tomahawk and with which, and with a club, after having painted my face and hands with coal dust in the shop of a blacksmith, we repaired to Griffin's Wharf, where the ships lay that contained the tea. When I first appeared in the street, after being thus disguised, I fell in with many who were dressed, equipped, and painted as I, and who fell in with me, and marched in order to the place of our destination. When we arrived at the wharf, there were three of our number who assumed all authority to direct our operations, to which we readily submitted. They divided us into three parties, for the purpose of boarding the three ships which contained the tea at that time. The name of him who commanded... <coughs> rats. I'm sorry. Doing things with one hand is really a challenge. The name of him who commanded the division to which I was assigned was Leonard Pitt. The names of the other commanders I never knew. We were immediately ordered by the respective commanders to board all the ships at the same time which we promptly obeyed. The commander of the division to which I belonged, as soon as we were on board the ship, appointed, my boat swing, appointed me boat swing and ordered me to go to the cabin and demand of him the keys to the hatches and a dozen candles. I made the demand accordingly, and the captain promptly replied and delivered the articles, but requested me at the same time to do no damage to the ship or its rigging. We were then ordered by our commander to open the hatches and take out all the chests of tea and throw them overboard, and we immediately proceeded to execute his orders, first cutting and splitting the chests with our tomahawks as though to expose them, so as to expose them thoroughly to the effects of the water. In about three hours from the time we went on board, we had thus broken and thrown overboard every tea chest to be found in the ship, 
while those in the other ships were disposing of their tea in the same way at the same time. We were surrounded by British armed ships, but no attempt was made to stop us. We then quietly retired to our several places of residence without having any conversation with each other or taking any measures to discuss who our associates were. Nor do I recollect of our having had the knowledge of the name of a single individual concerned in that affair, except that of Leonard Pitt, the commander of my division, whom I have mentioned. There appeared, appeared to be an understanding that each individual should volunteer his services, keep his own secret, secret, and risk the consequences for himself. No disorder took place during that transaction, and it was observed at that time that it was the stillest night that had ensued in Boston for many months. Isn't that amazing? The story of this? I mean, it's just, I, I just find it fascinating. He said, during the time we were throwing the tea overboard, there were several attempts made by some of the citizens of Boston to carry off small quantities of it for their family use. Uh-oh. <laughs> to affect that object, they would watch for opportunities to sneak up a handful of from the deck where it became plentifully scattered and put it in their pockets. One Captain O'Connor, whom I knew well, came on board for that purpose, and when he supposed that no one was noticing, he filled his pockets and the lining of his coat. But I had detected him and gave information to the captain of what was he was doing. We were ordered to take him into custody, and just as he was stepping from the vessel, I seized him by the skirt of his coat, and in an attempt to pull him back, I tore it off. But springing forward by a rapid effort, he made his escape. He had, however, to run a gauntlet through the crowd upon the wharf, each as he passed, giving him a kick or a stroke. <laughs> Another attempt was made to save a little tea from the ruins of the cargo by a tall, aged man who, or aged man who wore a large cocked hat and a white wig, which was fashionable at that time. He had slipped a little into his pocket, but being detected, they seized him and took his hat and his wig from his head, threw them together with the tea, of which they had emptied his pockets, into the water. In consideration of his advanced, of his advanced age, he was permitted to escape only with now and then a slight kick. <laughs> it's, just, it's just amazing. It's just a marvelous story. So, uh, the... The founders, as a consequence of having won the war against the British East India Company, it really was a war against the British East India Company, as much as it was a war against the United Kingdom, because they were simply the defenders of this country, or of this uh, company, rather, really, excuse me. Um, the, the, the founders were quite concerned about the, the status and power of corporations. There was a great debate in the Constitutional Convention about whether the word corporation should even uh, be found in the Constitution, and they ultimately decided not to include it because they wanted, they thought that the corporations like they'd seen with the East India Company had such a tendency or such a potential for malfeasance that they wanted to make sure that they were held accountable by local authorities and that, and that so only, only a state could create a corporation. From that time, from 1776 or arguably 1787 when we became officially a nation, um, and the Constitution was ratified, until the late 1890s, a corporation could only be incorporated for one purpose. You could create a corporation around a railroad, but that corporation couldn't also grow wheat. A corporation could not own stock in another corporation. It was illegal. These giant mergers and acquisitions, totally illegal. A corporation could only live for 20 to 40 years, depending on the states. Every state had its own law, but the, the, the shortest was 20 years, and I believe that was Connecticut. The longest was 40 years, and that was Delaware. And the idea was that if the corporation was used to amass wealth, you didn't want the corporation to be able to live longer than a human being could, because otherwise it could be used to create the equivalent of a family dynasty. So corporations had to be shut down. They got the death penalty after 40 years. All of their assets were sold and dissolved. Everything essentially went through probate and was taxed. And then people could buy those pieces and start it all over again, which happened from time to time. In fact, happened frequently. A corporation had to, as its first purpose of doing business, serve the public good. That had to be the first sentence of its Articles of Incorporation. The Secretary of State of every state had to, by law, every year examine the books of, of every corporation operating in that state and determine if they were operating in public good, and if they weren't, they got the corporate death sentence. The average up until the 1880s was 2,000 companies a year that got the corporate death sentence. A corporation's books had to be completely open at all times to any official from the state in which it was incorporated. Okay, just consider, I mean, how, how, how vastly different that is from today. 
Now, we have a situation today where uh, Dow Chemical has claimed all the way to the Supreme Court that when the EPA flew a plane over one of their factories that was illegally discharging benzene into the air and took photos of it and tried to use those photos to prosecute them, that Dow Chemical had illegally violated their Fourth Amendment right to privacy. Now keep in mind, if you go to work for a corporation, as soon as you walk in the door, you lose your Fourth Amendment right to privacy. They can ask for bodily fluids, they can videotape you, they can listen to your phone conversations, they can check every keystroke, but the corporation keeps its Fourth Amendment right of privacy continuously, no matter what. The tobacco companies and the asbestos companies for a century, for almost a century, since the 1930s, have been claiming that their Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination allows them to hide what they knew about the dangers of tobacco and asbestos. The uh, large hog farms, the big agricultural companies, uh, toxic waste incinerator operations, and perhaps most perniciously big box retailers have claimed that the 14th Amendment, which says that, that no person can be, denied equal, unequal, or can be denied equal protection under the law, the 14th Amendment, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were passed to free the slaves. And they've claimed that under the 14th Amendment, that if you say that, you know, if a white person can sit at a lunch counter, so must a black person have the legal right. Then similarly, if you say that a small business can do business in your community, then you have to let Walmart do business in your community. Otherwise, you're discriminating. You're violating their 14th Amendment right of uh, due process, of equal, equal protection under the law. Now, how did this bizarre doctrine come about? In, in 18... Well, let me back up a little bit. I was, when Louise and I first moved to Vermont, back in uh, 1996, I think it was, or 1997, we bought a, an, uh, an old house, it was built in 1850. And over the carriage house, over the roof of the carriage house, there was a, a, an attic that it looked like nobody had been in for decades. And there were several boxes of books up there that were badly water damaged, the boxes were, and the books were. And it was basically trash, you know, that came with the house. And I started going through it, and there was some old magazines, The American Catholic. And the last, the most recent one that was in there was 18, uh, 1931. So it seemed like that, those boxes had been there at least since, or probably since the mid-1930s. And I found in there a complete 20-volume collection of the one and only time in the history of the United States that Thomas Jefferson's complete writings had ever been published, which was in 1909, 1908, by the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Society. And it was the anniversary of his leaving office 100 years earlier, and it, 20 volumes. And had they been in pristine condition, it would have been worth thousands and thousands of dollars. But as it was, they were falling apart. I mean, you know, I couldn't even sell them on eBay had I wanted to. But I didn't really want to. I wanted to read them. And they were actually in readable condition. And we had just, Louise and I just sold an ad agency and we were kind of retired. And, and uh, at least, I mean, we've done this a bunch of times in our lives. We'll, you know, work hyperactively and insanely for, for uh, you know, five years, six years, whatever, build a business up, sell it off, and then take a few years and goof off and spend time with our kids or whatever. And so for the next two years, I just, I was buried in Thomas Jefferson. I was reading his personal letters. I mean, things that had never been published before outside of this one time in, in 1908. And it was, I was just so blown away by his worldview and, and so much of the history that I knew about him that was wrong and so much of the history about him that I didn't know at all and, I, and, and how horrified he would have been at America as it is today with monopolies. When he was envoy to France, when he was the, uh, the envoy to France, when, in 1787, when the Constitution was being written in, in Philadelphia, his protege was James Madison, the fa father of the Constitution, the guy who was actually writing, wrote the first draft of the document, had spent five years, in fact, Madison, five years studying the constitutions of other countries so that he could, uh, you know, lead the Constitutional Convention and, and help write the Constitution. And And when Madison finished, yeah, 89 to 92, when Madison finished the first draft of the Constitution, 
he mailed it to Thomas Jefferson, to his mentor. I mean, these guys were, it was a father-son relationship. It was just amazing, um, the relationship that these two men had. You read their letters and things. And on December 20th, 1787, Jefferson writes him back a letter. And he says, uh, he first off starts out talking about how, you know, what a great job you did, and obviously so much work went into this, and, and you and all these, the people who are working on it, and I honor you, and it was just, you know, not just, you know, BS praise, it was genuine praise, and he found a bunch of things that he just loved about the Constitution, and he pointed them out. And then he wrote, I will now tell you what I do not like. First of all, the omission of a Bill of Rights, providing clearly without aid of sophism the freedom of religion, freedom of the press, protection against standing armies, restriction of monopolies, the eternal and unremitting force of the laws of habeas corpus, and trials by jury in all matters of fact triable by the laws of the land and not by the laws of nations. He said, let me add that a Bill of Rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth, general or particular, and what no just government should refuse or, test or rest on inference. On February 7th, he wrote a letter to Alexander Donald, who was you know, one of the people who was writing. He started lobbying. This is his lobbying effort. He's writing letters like crazy from, from Paris. He says, by a declaration of rights, I mean one that shall stipulate freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom from commerce against monopolies, trial by jury in all cases, no suspensions of habeas corpus, no standing armies. These are fetters against doing evil, which no honest government should decline. And he kept pushing, and then he started pushing really hard, because he had a lot of influence with Virginia. And so he started threatening, because the Bill of Rights hadn't been put into the Constitution. I mean, Madison was working. None of its executives or decision makers ever saw the inside of a jail. How can this be? So when I asked this question, when I started writing this book, I originally started, started out to write a book called What Would Jefferson Do, which I later finished and is in print. But um, I was going through kind of the history of America and how did all this come together? And I kept reading in other people's books uh, Charles and Mary Beard's 1930 History of America, which is the most famous history, you know, short of arguably Howard Zinn's that's ever been written about the, 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 the United States up until the 1930s. Um, Charles Beard was a history professor at Princeton University, and, and in their day they were absolute rock stars. Uh, Mary Beard was one of the leaders, a major socialist and a major women's right, rights leader. Um, David Corton's When Corporations Rule the World. Um, and many other books. In all these books, I read that in 1886, the Supreme Court said corporations are persons and uh, under the 14th Amendment and entitled to equal protection under the law. And that began this whole process. And because I was writing the book, I was trying to original source everything. It makes me crazy when I read books where people are quoting other authors rather than the original sources. So I had all of Jefferson's stuff. So I wanted to find the original, the actual original Supreme Court decision. Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad, in which the Supreme Court allegedly gave this personhood and turned everything on its head and turned America from a democracy into an oligarchy. I wanted to read that decision so that I could put it in the book in the actual language. So I went down to the Vermont uh, uh, Supreme Court building, which was just about 10 blocks from our house, and uh, Vermont was a sovereign nation before it joined the United States. Vermont and Texas are the only two. And it had a really old library. It's just great. I mean, it's just incredible. They've got everything there. And I went in and, and talked to Paul Donovan, who was the head librarian. I believe he's also an attorney. And because it's the law library for the Supreme Court. And I said, Paul, I'm looking for the 1886 Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad decision. And he was like, oh, the one where corporations became people. Like, yeah, that one. And he says, well, I think it's over here somewhere. And he takes me back along these long, dusty rows and finds this holes off the shelf. The, the, black, leather-bound, blows the dust off the top, you know, the original, published in 1888, the original edition of the 1886 notes from the Supreme Court, uh, published by Biddle and Banks in, in New York City, and, and opens it on the table and, and flips through it until he finds it, and he says, okay, here's the head note, that's a page or two, he says, that's just the notes from the clerk, it doesn't matter, and then here's the decision, it starts right here and it goes for 19 pages. So I sat down and I read the decision. And the decision, it was, a, it was an argument about whether or not the railroad should have to pay taxes, property taxes on fence posts. 
And uh, they were claiming that they didn't have to, and Santa Clara County was claiming that they did have to. And it amounted to just, you know, a few, a, a few thousand dollars. I mean, this is, and they took this all the way to the Supreme Court. And I'm reading through the case, and they made several arguments about why they didn't have to pay the taxes, and ultimately the court found that in the, in, in the California Constitution, it explicitly gives individual counties the right to set property tax rates for fence posts along railroad rights of way. End of decision. And then at the very end, there was two paragraphs, and you can read all this online. I mean, you can, you can Google the thing. It's over scotus.gov, you know, it's the Supreme Court has it right online. And one of the last paragraphs said, several other arguments were made before the court, including one on constitutional grounds, but because this court, I'm paraphrasing, but it's pretty close, but because this court was able to find a specific remedy in the Constitution of California, there was no need to address the federal constitutional issues. I'm looking at that going, wait a minute, this doesn't say corporations are people. In fact, it says we didn't, we didn't decide anything like that. There was no decision in court versions of people. So I went back to Paul and I said, Paul, I think I got something wrong here. Maybe this is the wrong case. And he said, I'm pretty sure it's the right case. And I said, well, here, you look through it and you find it for me. And he's standing there going, and he gets to the very end and he reads that last couple of paragraphs. He goes, oh, that's really weird. And I said, well, you know, what is it? He said, I don't know. He says, let's check the head note. So he flips forward to the front. Now, a head note is a commentary written by the clerk of the court. It has no legal authority. In fact, there was a Supreme Court case in 1908 that explicitly determined that, but it never had legal authority. It was basically, in fact, the, the, the clerk of the court wrote the head notes and was paid to do that by the publishing company, Biddle and Banks in New York. It was his way of adding value to the Supreme Court things, and in fact, he made about $10,500 a year, whereas the Supreme Court justices at that time, 1886, only made $10,000. He, he made more money than they did by writing head notes. So anyway, he flips to the head note, and here it is in the second paragraph of the head note. Uh, corporations are persons under the 14th Amendment and entitled to equal protection under the law. I'm like, what? And Paul is like, well, that's weird. And I said, well, what does it mean? And he said, well, it's in the head note, but it's not in the decision. And I said, does that mean that it's legal? And he said, no, it's not legal. So I thought, oh boy, I've got, you know, <laughs> we've got the keys to the kingdom here. You know? <laughs> He said, but you really need to talk to somebody who knows the law better than I do. So I paid my 70 cents and we very carefully made copies of all 24 pages, you know, the head notes and the decision. And I went around the corner to the office of an attorney who was a friend of mine, Jim Ritvo, and I laid it out on Jim's table in his office. In his, he had a kind of conference table in his office. I said, Jim, I've got to, I'd like you to look at this. He said, I, he said, what is it? I said, it's the 1886 Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad case. He said, so the one where corporations became people. I said, yeah. <laughs> and I said, so here's the decision. Read this and read this and it's about fence posts and here's the, you know, and the arguments and here's the, you know, and, and I read these last couple paragraphs. And he reads it and he goes, well, that's weird. <laughs> and then I said, now look at the head note. And he reads the head note and goes, holy shit. Pardon my language here in the church. <laughs> and I said, what? And he said, the, the head note not only is wrong, but it's the exact opposite of the decision. And I said, does that mean that we can blow up corporations? Is this like the end? You know, is this the beginning of the new Tea Party or something? And he's like, you know, I don't know. He says, I don't think so, but it seems like it should be. He said, you need to talk to a constitutional lawyer. I do mostly wills and real estate and stuff, so... Uh, you know, uh, uh, he said, you ought to call uh, Deb Markowitz. She's the Secretary of State. And she knows the constitutional law quite well. She's well known for that. So one of the cool things about living in a state capital that only has 8,000 people in it is that when you call the Secretary of State's office and, you know, hello, may I speak with Deb Markowitz? This is she. <laughs> and I had had her, it's an elected office. And the previous November, and this was in January, I'd had her sign out in front of my house, and we live on the main drag. And so I said, Deb, you don't know me, but we have friends in common with Alan Shelley Cohen. And they gave me one of your yard signs, and I put them out in front of our house there on Northfield Drive. And she's like, oh, yeah, I know where that is. I drove by that every day. Thank you. And I said, you're welcome. Now I have a question for you, <laughs> now that I buttered her up. And I said, I, my question is about the 1886 Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad case. And she said, oh, you mean the one where corporations became people? And I was like, yeah, that one. And so I read to her what I learned, 
and there was this long silence, and you could kind of tell that she was thinking of saying what Jim said, but she wasn't going to say it out loud. And I said, what does it mean? And she said, well, clearly there's an error. And I said, does that mean that corporations aren't persons? And she said, no, actually, she said, I know that there have been over 30 cases, that, it turns out it was 34, 30 cases that have quoted that headnote. And so the first case that quoted the headnote became the precedent. Became, she said, the Supreme Court can quote Daffy Duck. And it doesn't matter what they quote, it matters what they decide. And so, you know, the first time they quoted the head note, it became precedent. So she said the 1886 case is not the precedent, but the first one after that, which was about 12 years later, uh, is the precedent. So this, so, so I said, so, you know, what do we do about it? And she said, I'm, I'm not sure. It's, you know, start digging into it. And I did, and that's what led to this book. By the way, I, uh, because I, did I mention this book will be available at the end? I did, didn't I? <laughs> So, the, uh, this, this is the, 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 this fascinating stuff here. We, the Supreme Court, in a series of cases, um, Boston versus Bilotti, First National Bank of Boston versus uh, Bilotti, in that case, the Massachusetts had a law that said that a corporation cannot run political advertising unless it's about something that directly affects the corporation. But the First National Bank was running an ad in favor of a ballot initiative or a candidate that had nothing to do with the bank. And so I think his name was Frank Pilotti, was the attorney general, and he sued them. This was in the 1980s. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled, well, the First National Bank is a person based on the head note, 1886 case, and therefore uh, they have the right to have free speech. And then there was another case, Buckley versus Vallejo, where money and free speech were conflated. Well, a corporation doesn't have a mouth, but uh, money can be used. And most recently, on January 10th, or January 21st of 2010, the U.S. Supreme Court, in a case called Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission, the original argument was in McCain-Feingold, McCain-Feingold limits the, the contributions of corporations and persons to a couple thousand bucks and you know there's all these rules and Citizens United was a right-wing group that had done a movie uh, a hit movie on Hillary Clinton and they wanted to run TV ads promoting it and a lower court had said if you run those ads those are actually campaign commercials and so they have to be you know you have to they have to fall within the boundaries of McCain-Feingold so they ended up not running the ads and the next year that was, 90, that was the election of uh, 2008. And, in, and the next year, in 2009, they took it to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, there's no water up here, is there? No? Okay, that's all right, I'll, I'll survive. Um, the Supreme Court, um, interestingly, heard the arguments on this one narrow part of McCain-Feingold. And after they heard the whole argument, after it was all done, Justice Thomas, excuse me, Justice uh, Roberts said to Ted Olson, the guy who was arguing the case, we're not going to decide on this. We're not going to decide whether or not to blow up this little piece of McCain-Feingold. Instead, I'd like you to come back in six months, re-argue the case, only this time take the whole swath of whether corporations are persons, whether they have free speech rights, and whether money is speech. Take the whole thing. And so Ted Olson came back and argued the case against Alina Kagan, who was arguing on behalf of the government that corporations aren't persons. God bless you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, have... uh, Louise, would you mind? <laughs> I'm so confident. I just that's, um, bite it off or something. Um, so. They, they went back, they re-argued it, it went before the court, and, and the most amazing decision came out. Ah, boy, that's wonderful. You really appreciate water when you're like on the edge. Okay, 
This is the decision. It was written by Justice Kennedy, but it was basically dictated by Justice Roberts. Roberts defined who got to write, or who had to write the decision, and he stuck Kennedy with this job, which in, there's a whole bunch of weird Supreme Court politics that has to do with that, which is a whole other fascinating story that's as bizarre as the Tea Party, but I won't bore you with it right now. Um, so anyhow, Kennedy began the decision. This is the, the five to four decision of the majority in Citizens United. He says, premised on mistrust of governmental power, the First Amendment stands against attempts to disfavor certain subjects or viewpoints. Sounds good, right? Sounds like something Martin Luther King might say. By taking the right to speak from some and giving it to others, the government deprives the disadvantaged persons or class of the right to use speech to strive to establish worth, standard, standing, and respect for the speaker's voice. The government may not by these means deprive the public of the right and privilege to determine for itself what speech and speakers are worthy of consideration. So who was this disadvantaged persons or class? Well, the next paragraph, it's right there. The court has recognized that First Amendment protections extend to corporations. Under the rationale of these presidents, political speech does not lose First Amendment protection simply because its source is a corporation. The court has, is thus rejecting the argument that political speech of corporations or other associations should be treated differently under the First Amendment simply because such an associations are not, quote, natural persons, end quote. And then he goes on. It's just in full tilt rant. Now, let me just give you a little bit of background on this, and then I'll be wrapping this up. There are two kinds of people under the law, two kinds of persons, historically. This goes all the way back to British common law in the 6th century. One is natural persons, that's you and me. The other is artificial persons, which is governments, corporations, and churches. Now, artificial persons have to have some sort of legal status, otherwise they can't pay taxes, they can't own land, they can't be sued, they can't engage in business. So they're called artificial persons. Well, here's the problem, and this is, this is how the Supreme Court supposedly ruled in 1886. The basis of the argument that was made was that the 14th Amendment says, and this is exactly what it says, now listen to this, and listen very carefully, because when the word persons come along, comes along, the word natural is not before it. That's the key to the whole thing. So the railroad was saying, hey, we're a person, and they legally are an artificial person. But listen to the context. I mean, who could not think that this was about people? The, once again, the, the 14th Amendment ratified in 1774 to free the slaves after the Civil War. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor denied to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. That's the basis on which Justices Thomas, Roberts, Kennedy, Scalia, and Alito said that artificial persons have the rights that the founders fought and died for, that Thomas Jefferson nearly brought down the Constitution of the United States to get written into the Bill of Rights. So here's, in full Sturm and Drang, this is, uh, again, this is Kennedy for the winners. The censorship we now confront is vast in its reach. What he's talking about is the fact that McCain-Feingold prevented corporations from speaking. He's calling that censorship. The government has muffled the voices that best represent the most significant segments of our economy. Well, yeah, they own the damn thing. And the electorate has been deprived of information, knowledge, and opinion vital to its function by suppressing the speech of manifold corporations, both for-profit and non-profit, the government prevents their voices and viewpoints from reaching the public and advising voters on which persons or entities are hostile to their interests. I'm reading from a damn Supreme Court decision. Does this make sense to any of you? This is nuts. Well, the other four people on the court said as much. Justice John Paul Stevens, who's retiring, wrote the dissenting 
the primary descent. He starts out by saying, this is a, in the first paragraph, calling the decision misguided, which is very strong language for the Supreme Court. He then went on to say, if taken seriously, our colleague's assumption that the identity of a speaker has no relevance to the government's ability to regulate political speech would lead to some remarkable conclusions. Such an assumption would have accorded the propaganda broadcast to our troops by Tokyo Rose during World War II the same protection of speech as our allied commanders. More pertinently, it would appear to afford the same protection of multinational corporations controlled by foreigners as to individual Americans. To do otherwise, after all, would enhance the relative voice of some, i.e. humans, over others, i.e. corporations. End quote. He then goes on to say, this is, this really, this really gets good. Stevenson goes on to say, corporations were created, supervised, and conceptualized as quasi-public entities designed to serve a social function for the state. It was assumed that they were legally privileged organizations that had to be closely scrutinized by the legislature because their purposes had to be made consistent with the public welfare. The word soulless constantly recurs in debates over corporations over the years before this court. Corporations, it was feared, could concentrate the worst urges of whole groups of men. Thomas Jefferson famously fretted that corporations would subvert our republic. The framers, he said, all general business corporation statutes appear to date from well after 1800. The framers thus took it as a given that corporations could be comprehensively regulated in the service of the public welfare. Unlike our colleagues, right, these five right-wing idiots on the court, unlike our colleagues, they, the founders, had little trouble distinguishing corporations from human beings. And when they constitutionalized the right to free speech in the First Amendment, it was the free speech of individual Americans they had in mind. He goes on then to quote Justice John Marshall, the first, well actually the second, but the, really for many purposes, the first Supreme Court Chief Justice in the 1803 Marbury versus Madison case, who said, quote, 1803, this is during Jefferson's presidency. This guy was his second cousin and they hated each other, but that's a whole other story. Anyhow, um, Chief Justice Marshall wrote, a corporation is an artificial being, invisible, intangible, and existing only in contemplation of law. Being a mere creature of law, it possesses only those properties which the charter of its creation confers upon it. Right, here he is, here's the, 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 an associate justice of the Supreme Court quoting the Chief Justice. He goes on to say, that uh, Robert Salito, Scalia, Thomas, and Kennedy, for their behavior in this case, represents, quote, the height of recklessness to dismiss Congress's years of bipartisan deliberation and its reasoned judgment. The fact, keep it, uh, just imagine how, I mean, you know, these are, uh, the Supreme Court, they always talk so softly, my gentle, you know, this, this is not that, this is war. The fact that corporations are different from human beings might seem to need no elaboration, except that the majority opinion almost completely elides it, misses it. Unlike natural persons, corporations have limited liability for their owners and managers. They have perpetual life. They have separation of ownership and control. They have favorable treatment of the accumulation of assets that enhance their ability to attract capital and to deploy their resources in ways that maximize the return of their shareholders' investments. Unlike voters in U.S. elections, corporations may be foreign controlled. They inescapably structure the life of every citizen. It might be added that corporations have no consciences, no beliefs, no feelings, no thoughts, no desires. Corporations help structure and facilitate the activities of human beings, to be sure, and their, quote, personhood, end quote, often serves as a useful legal fiction, but they are not themselves members of we the people for whom and by whom and for whom our Constitution was established. It's amazing. They go, you know, they go on, the majority seems oblivious to the simple truth that, corporations, that they are with this decision 
setting up a situation which does not merely pit the anti-corruption interest against the First Amendment, but also comp pits competing First Amendment values against each other. It is particularly problematic when the speakers in question are not real people. I mean, just, you know, bang. So, what we need to return to is the kind of law that was on the, oh, let me just add one thing. Remember Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad corporations became persons? Well, around that time, there were a few other people who wanted to be persons, too, and they took their cases to the Supreme Court. Back at that time, a, uh, in most states, a married woman was not allowed to make out a will because she was not allowed to own land or legally control anything else of value. Any property she brought into a marriage became her husband's at the moment of marriage and would only revert to her on his death, in which case a male court-appointed executor would supervise her for the rest of her life and would control two-thirds of her estate. When the widow died, the executor would either take the property for himself or decide to whom it would pass. The woman had no say in the matter because she had no right to sign a will. Women could not sue in court. If a man or family household died, the executor would decide who would raise the wife's children and in what religion. She had no right to make those decisions. It was impossible for a married woman to have legal responsibility for her children, control of her own property, buy or sell land, or even obtain an ordinary license. So on November 1st, 1872, Susan B. Anthony walked into a polling place and committed the crime of voting while female. Two weeks later, she was arrested. In court, she said, all persons are citizens and no state shall deny or abridge the citizen rights. The court said, sorry. Her conviction stood. A year later, in 1873, a woman by the name of Susan Bradwell in the city of Chicago got her law license and walked into a court to practice law. As she walked into the courtroom, the judge looked down from the bench and said, you're a woman. She said, yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. And he said, I will not have a woman in my court. And she said, I, I am licensed at the bar. And he said, Basically, tough luck, get out, and threw her out. He had her physically removed from the building. She sued, took it to the Supreme Court, cases Bradwell versus Illinois, 1873, and she lost. This is what the Supreme Court said. The same Supreme Court that said corporations have the rights of persons. Quote, in Bradwell versus Illinois, the family institution is repugnant to the idea of a woman adopting a distinct and independent career from that of her husband. So firmly fixed is this sentiment in the founders of the common law that it has become a maximum of that system of jurisprudence that a woman has no legal existence separate from her husband who is regarded as her head and representative in the social state. Isn't that incredible? So then, a few years later, a fellow by the name of Plessy got on a railroad car, walked into the whites only area, Railroad cop by the name of Ferguson arrested him, threw him off. He got back on, threw him off again. Third time, he arrested him, took him to, took him to court. The Plessy case, 1896, went to the U.S. Supreme Court. And in that case, court reporter John Chandler Bancroft Davis, the guy who wrote the head note that I read you earlier, who, by the way, when I started looking at it, who the hell is this guy who wrote this head note? He was the former president of the Newburgh and New York Railroad. Yeah. Anyhow, this is what he wrote in the head note to Plessy versus Ferguson. The object of the amendment was undoubtedly, he's talking about the 14th Amendment. The object of the amendment was undoubtedly to enforce the absolute equality of the two races before the law, but the nature of things could not have been intended to, in, to abolish distinctions based upon color or to enforce social as distinguished from political equality or to allow a co-mingling of the two races upon terms unsatisfactory to either. Supreme Court decision. Hugo Black in 1938, Justice of the Supreme Court, made the following astounding observation. Of the cases in this court in which the 14th Amendment was applied during the first 50 years after its adoption, fewer than one half of 1% of those cases involved its protection of the Negro race, and more than 50% asked that its benefits be extended to corporations. So, what do we need to do? We need to go back 
to, to the laws the way they used to be. And there's, a, there's actually a step to get there. The, the laws the, the, the way they used to be, you know, pretty straightforward stuff. If I can find the thing I was going to share with you. Um, the, the solution, here's the problem. In the 18 teens, the Supreme Court ruled that minimum wage laws were unconstitutional. They ruled that child labor laws were unconstitutional. They ruled that having unions was unconstitutional. They ruled that maximum hour laws were unconstitutional. Um, Franklin Roosevelt wasn't able to change those rules until the mid-1930s when a couple of members of the Supreme Court died and were replaced by more progressive people. So that's one way. I'm not wishing death on anybody, obviously, but you know, at, at some point the court turns over. And it's one of the reasons why I think it's so important that we be politically involved in the 2012 election, because the next president is going to be president when Scalia is in his late 70s and Kennedy is in his 80s. And if it's not a Democrat, we're really screwed. No matter how weak you know, or strong, you know, whatever our opinion of that Democrat may be. Okay, number one. And number two, if, if we don't, if we, you know, waiting for the Supreme Court to change it is one way. As I said, that was done back in, it took 20 years, but it was done back at the turn of the century. The other way is to amend the Supreme Court, or excuse me, amend the Constitution, the actual Constitution of the United States. And there is an amendment that has been proposed, it's been drafted by a bunch of people, the leader of the, of the gang I got together with back 10 years ago in San Francisco, we had this little group of people who were involved in the Nike versus Caskey case, the first time corporations claimed First Amendment right of free speech. And uh, David Cobb is the guy who put this thing together, he ran for president of the Green Party ticket in 2008. Good guy. And this is the constitutional amendment, and if you go to move to amend.org, you'll find links to it from tomhartman.com. Move to amend.org, they've got it laid out there, and reclaimdemocracy.org, Jeff Nelson's site, it's laid out there. But this is what we're trying to get passed. Now, people say it's impossible. There have been 29,000 amendments to the Constitution, and only, what, 27, 28 of them have ever passed, you know, all these attempts. But the fact of the matter is that the next to the last amendment to the Constitution, um, the one that lowered the voting age from 21 to 18, was introduced in March of 1971, was ratified by the last state in July of 1971. It took less than six months. It is possible when you've got enough pissed off people. When you get, you know, back then it was, you know, people not being able to vote on the war that they were being sent to, if we can get enough people active. Here's the constitutional amendment. Section one, the U.S. Constitution protects only the rights of living human beings. Section two, corporations and other institutions granted the privilege to exist shall be subordinate to any and all laws enacted by citizens in their elected governments. Section three, corporations and other for-profit institutions are prohibited from attempting to influence the outcome of elections, legislation, or government policy through the use of aggregate resources or by rewarding or repaying employees or directors to exert such influence. That's the constitutional amendment that we're trying to pass. And what it would do, And this is where I'm going to wrap this up. And what it would do is it would make this law that I'm going to read to you right now possible again. Every single state in the union had a law that said virtually identically the same language as this law I'm about to read to you. This is a Wisconsin law. Um, it was repealed in the 1950s when they discovered that it was still on the books. Every other state had repealed similar laws in the 1890s uh, as a result of the efforts by and large of John Rockefeller. And that's a whole other story, but in any case, this is the law. It's titled Political Contributions by Corporations. And, and if we were to amend the Constitution, we could pass this law. No corporation doing business in this state shall pay or contribute, or offer consent or agree to pay or contribute, directly or indirectly, any money, property, free service of its officers or employees or thing of value to any political party, organization, committee, or individual for any political purpose whatsoever or for the purpose of influencing legislation of any kind or to promote or defeat the candidacy of any person for nomination, appointment, or election to any political office. Now keep in mind this law was put in the books back in the 1820s. 
Some of them in the late 1700s, when, you know, a thousand bucks was a couple of years' income, it was big money. Penalty. Any officer, employee, agent, or attorney, or other representative of any corporation acting for and behalf of such corporation shall violate this act, shall be punished upon conviction by a fine of not less than 100 nor more than $5,000, and by imprisonment in the state prison for a period of not less than one nor more than five years. If it is a domestic corporation, in other words, if it's incorporated in that state, it shall be dissolved, and if it is a foreign corporation or non-resident corporation, its right to do business in this state is declared forfeit. End of decision. So, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got to wake up a lot of people to how, how this came about, what's going on, what we can do about it. There are some major citizens' movements going on around the United States to roll back corporate personhood and change these laws. And I would like to, to offer you an opportunity to enlist yourself in all of these efforts. If you want to see small d democracy return to our small r republic, uh, to be totally politically correct and satisfy the Republicans in the group, um, then this is the way to do it. It's to get the money out of politics, which means get the corporate power out of politics. Thanks so much, and tag your it. So if there's one thing that you'd like people to take away from your talk tonight, what would that be? That uh, we no longer have capitalism in the United States. We have monopoly capitalism. The monopolies are anti-competitive and anti-democratic, and that we need to begin breaking up those monopolies but in a bizarre way, they have acquired the rights of human beings. They are now superhuman beings. And, it's, and you know, we're going to have to amend the Constitution to take those rights away from them before we can start to rebalance the playing field and start, about, and start talking about converting America from an oligarchy back to a democracy, or a republic, if you prefer. One quick follow-up question. Which one is your favorite Firesign Theater album? <laughs> Waiting for the electrician or someone like him. All right, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Cynthia. Hi. So, what did you think of uh, tonight's speech? It was very educational. I learned much more than I have, I think, in this one night than I learned in many years of history class. Wow. Yep. Wow, that's interesting. So, if you can just uh, tell the folks out there one thing or something that sums up what you did take away from tonight's speech, what would that be? That would be that um, Tom Hartman and apparently many other people believe that we can make real change in our nation that would benefit people, the environment, the globe, by um, having an amendment to the Constitution that would take us back to much earlier laws of this nation that would keep um, corporations in their proper place subservient to human beings wow. instead of human beings being super, uh, subservient to corporations. Mm. And the way that he did his research on this and spoke made me feel like he is a true patriot. Mm. Well, great. And um, sounds like you really enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for taking the time to stop by and talk to us. Okay, you're welcome. So, Dave. What did you think of uh, tonight's um, presentation and speech? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't spend too much time in churches myself, mm -hmm. but if it's always like this, I could see doing it more, you know? Yeah, yeah. So um, I understand that he's one of your uh, mentors or someone yeah, that you... on the TV show he does and on some of the public radio stuff. Yeah, so I listen to a lot of his show, and it's great, you know, just working together. We have, we're on a lot of the same stations, too. Mm -hmm. And if you can um, just sum up um, one thing that really stood out for you on what he talked about tonight. What would that be? I guess corporations aren't really people. Mm, I like that. Corporations aren't really people. <laughs> well, thanks, Dave. And uh, you did a great job um, introducing and bringing them in. Thanks. So you're one of the sponsors. Marlboro College is a sponsor of this talk tonight. And we're curious about, of all the speakers that you might have sponsored, why did you pick Tom Hartman? Well, um, one thing I want to just be specific about is that um, it's the Marlboro College Graduate School that's sponsoring. We are part of Marlboro College. Right. And um, I represent the MBA program. I'm the director of the MBA in Managing for Sustainability. Um, although we have uh, the dean of the graduate school with us tonight and uh, Chris Lenoir, who handles marketing for the whole college. So it's, re it's really a group effort. But um, I think where Tom Hartman's 
thinking and writing and, and, and what his audience, audience is interested connects to uh, Marlboro College is really, or to the graduate school, is, is, is heavily um, connected to the MBA program in particular. Because we have other graduate degrees as well that have more to do with, with technology, with teaching, with, with uh, management of technology, project management. But the MBA is based around some pretty deep questioning of what business is about and what business is for. Our, our motto or our, our slogan, our call to action is change the climate of business. And we state that this is an MBA in managing for sustainability. So what that means is that in every facet of business, leadership, money, capital markets, operations, um, marketing, the notion of the consumer, in every facet of business where there's something that seems to be getting in the way of sustainability, we believe that there's a, there's, there's a question to research and a problem to fix. And it's, it's a pretty overwhelming prospect when you put them all together because because as sustainability is defined, there are questions of ecological health and integrity, questions of environmental protection, questions of natural resource depletion or conservation, questions of social justice, of uh, community health, of global solidarity. I mean, the list is very long. When you say sustainability, it's a lot of different things. But if we apply this broad concept of sustainability to all these different facets of, of the business world, there are problems and deep questions and dysfunctions everywhere. And what, what Tom Hartman was, was focusing on tonight is fascinating to me because what he was focusing on is, is, the, is the, the form of organized, the, the form of organization that our society sanctions to get things done. For whom, by whom, who controls them, what are they for, how do you finance them? And uh, we actually have a course called Equity, Ownership, and Control. And the course is all about for any particular mission, you know, whatever it might be, um, feeding the poor, insulating the, the buildings of, of low-income people, um, entertaining the world with something brilliant, manufacturing cars, you name it. What it for, for, for any given business mission, what is the most appropriate form of organization who owns it, who controls it, and how do you finance it? And when I say what's most appropriate, that, that has to leave business as usual and go deeper into questions of what's sustainable. So, you know, he was, he was his book and, and what he was talking about um, is, is deeply relevant to one particular course in our program, but it's also very broadly relevant to pretty much everything we do. Thank you very much, Ralph Mima.